good afternoon, distinguished guests, and uh, thank you very much, Duncan and Margaret, for inviting me to speak to you and share with you about big data. Just as Duncan was saying that uh, Baidu is a giant in the room, but I, we always feel small and nimble at heart, and we try to run quickly and, and small and nimble as well. And of course, we're trying very hard to do so. So today, I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we see big data, a new frontier. And of course, when people think about Baidu, we think about search engine, searching. A lot of people are searching on Baidu. We, can feel, we call this the heartbeat, right? the heartbeat of China. And a lot of people come to us to understand the heartbeat of China. Our, our partners, advertisers, big conglomerates, they come into China, they say, ooh, China is a very big market, I want to understand. Oh, I think I know the big tiers, the, the top tier cities pretty well. I know Beijing, I know Shanghai. But when you start going into inland, what do people think? What do they have in mind? What moves them? How do I say to them? And this is where they come to Baidu and say, come, let's look at the big data and see how we can understand the consumer, the markets together. And for that, we have used our, tried a lot of effort to build up a very big infrastructure. And today, I'm going to share with you a little bit how we do so beneath the hood. So a little bit about um, the numbers, big numbers. Uh, we serve about 5 billion queries a day, and that's pretty big for any single market, bigger than um, the US market for Google, uh, Microsoft, Yahoo combined. Uh, we serve about five, over 500 million internet users, so pretty big portion of internet users will touch by Google one way or the other, through search and also our um, user properties. Um, we have um, user-generated content as well. Uh, not only do we search users to create content as well, and they create about 4 million posts and all forms of information, pieces of information a day. Um, we also serve our business customers, and a lot of these business clients, uh, um, 500,000 of them, they are like big, small, medium-sized advertisers, brand advertisers, a lot of them that I work with closely uh, because I'm in charge of the uh, monetization platform at Baidu. Uh, mobile search users. Mobile is ramping up very quickly. Uh, towards, the uh, uh, towards the end of last year, it caught us a little bit by surprise as well. Uh, the shift. We, people call it the shift from PC to mobile. We say, yeah, mobile will be here. Mobile is big. But we are a little bit surprised at the pace at which it happens. So right now, we are serving about 100 million plus the mobile users daily. daily. And that's a very big number. And today, I think uh, we probably see like 98% of the uh, smartphone, Android phones, and including the uh, uh, iOS phones, will have by doing as the default search engine. So we look at big data, we talk about the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, and the value. Uh, we work very hard to, to uh, answer and address all these issues about volume. The volume is growing very rapidly at a very, very rapid pace as well, especially when you move, start moving from PC to the mobile internet. And all kinds of information, not only just, uh, we say, search queries. We have all kinds of information now. We're just deloged with all this information. And within it, how do you decipher, how do you siphon off the value, find valuable information, and act intelligently among the big data? And that's something that we strive to do. And I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, in terms of just, in terms of, uh, amount of information that's building up and collecting over the internet, um, we have about 100 plus petabytes of uh, web pages and links that you combine together. And when you say pet petabyte, I mean, it, what exactly is a petabyte? So we just give, give some rough comparison. Let's say the National Library of China, Guotu, right? Uh, it has maybe two times of that, it's about one, one petabyte. And we have all these combined together, 100 plus petabytes of information on, about web pages and links. Uh, regarding post encyclopedia knowledge information, UGC, one petabyte of such information. And logs, which, uh, all our system generate a lot of logs from mobile users, from uh, queries, and so on. And it generates over 100 pet, uh, petabytes. And uh, it's growing very rapidly too, the growth, 100% year over year growth. And it only had 95% of the data was collected in the last three years. Okay. So last three years with mobile and so on, you can see this explosion, explosion in the, in the uh, data that we collect. So typically, we collect about 100 petabytes of new data, process it every day, every day. So this scale is, is unthinkable, even a couple of years ago. And we continue to strive to cope with that scale and still continue to grow 
and, and it's a lot of, those are a lot of technical challenges on us. To solve the technical challenge, we have to do a lot of innovation, both on the hardware front and also on the software front. On the hardware, I just want to throw out some of the innovations and some of the things we work very, very hard <coughs> to do. For example, we have custom uh, ARM-based uh, servers. And why we choose ARMs? And because uh, it's low power and we can stack them uh, a lot more, a more density. So we can see using an ARM-based server's approach, we have an uh, increase in intensity of over 70%. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we reduce the total cost of ownership of owning such a data center by 25%. Custom rack uptime uh, efficiency. We build the custom rack so that we can speed up the process at which we can deploy these servers and we can make it up and running quick enough. And with our custom rack designs, we can have a 10x improvement in bringing the system up to speed and to cope with the increasing volume of data. Um, running this large amount of data, all these servers, you think of, wow, there should be a lot of power, very en energy uh, hungry, right? It is so, it is so. Uh, we pay a lot of electric bills uh, uh, in, in China. So to do that, we actually make a lot of effort. Uh, we, think, we believe that we have the greenest, the greenest data centers that we run with the uh, PUE, which is a measurement of the, uh, the power utility of 1.18, and we're very proud of that. We have a lot of effort has put in that to achieve a best rate of 1.18 for PUE. And uh, on the average, it's about 1.37. We are very proud of these numbers because we work very hard together with our vendors, our partners, to achieve, to get into this kind of low power consumption uh, category. And to do so, we can achieve with non-cooling hours of uh, up to 40%. And what does it mean? You know when the servers run very hard, you have to turn on the air conditioning to keep the the servers down, we actually get achieved 48% of the time. We don't need to do so. And that has to be a major factor in, in, in bringing down the, uh, the PUE. And there's a lot of technologies involved in helping to build the green data center. Uh, even storage, we have to think about storage differently. We see about all these petabytes of information, um, uh, several orders of magnitudes of the uh, National Library of China. How do we store them? We talk about customized, uh, SSD flash storage are customized our design. So we work with the uh, top storage vendors to customize the way data are stored. Okay. When you buy the, the, the storage off the rack, either you can buy a home use storage or you can buy a, a enterprise storage. But we are neither both. And for, for, for us to use the service effectively, we actually have to custom design it. And our, our results so far, we can see a performance of two times with a reduction of cost of uh, more than 48%. And this is a picture of the data center that we're talking about. Uh, it's at the uh, Robbins, uh, our CEO, hometown, uh, well, the province, home province called Shanxi. It's our cloud computing infrastructure, the IBC. This is one of the few that we are building ourselves. Right now, it's in the stage of, uh, of uh, going to construction. And we build these green data centers, and we continue to build more with, uh, uh, as we learn uh, as we go. Uh, even the software side, we have to do a lot of innovations as well to serve as this large scale. And the traditional uh, server stack of uh, having a database working on the monolithic hardware will not work anymore. So you can see all this is based on distributed hardware. And when we talk about that, people sort of take it for, for, um, for, for, for granted now that the, uh, the predominant way now is to do distributed computing right? with Hadoop, relational databases sitting on top, map reduce across. So everything that we do is all based on this kind of uh, infrastructure. And on top of that, we, we do have to innovate to achieve the kind of scale, to achieve global optimization, to do replication better, to do data distribution better, balancing the whole data. So when you talk about big data, the big data doesn't come cheap, big data doesn't come for free. Somebody has to do the work to make sure that the big data come into, all the bits come into together. Some examples of how we process big data in the increasing the, uh, the increasing velocity. For example, we do uh, machine learning. A lot of these data, you need to, to make sense out of it. You need to do very large scale machine learning. And this, I throw out some numbers here, just to have a sense of the scale. Okay. Data is data, it's not intelligent until you learn something from it and you apply to it. Okay. What we are doing right now, we can achieve real time online machine learning, real time. So as we are showing information, as people query, as they interact with our system, as they um, put new pieces of information, generate new content, we make all these into a big learning algorithms. And from this real-time learning of 
tens of billions of training data, we can achieve uh, with a complexity of uh, billions of features. And this is a pretty, uh, this is world class, world class, uh, and we continue to push the envelope forward and doing this large scale machine learning real time. And below offline, long line, I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, these are just some of the necessary steps to process as the data goes through the pipeline and understanding them, going through in a stream process basis. For those of you in technology, you probably understand that the, uh, doing so is, is quite a remarkable effort. Um, even a simple thing as a, a keyword input, right, uh, the input method, there's a lot of machine learning behind it as well. People type into these um, phrases, and we actually update the dictionary in real time, and we do dynamic result modeling, modeling how people behave and how they interact behind the scene, and doing so in real time. And at the same time, as we learn this new dictionary and push out to the users, so to make all the uh, usage on the internet more um, efficient. And we're talking about learning, we're talking about pushing the envelope of learning. There are some breakthrough in the recent uh, uh, couple of years, very recently in this space called domain called uh, deep learning. And deep learning, as you can imagine, is sort of like uh, using a neural network of machine learning algorithm, but this time in deploying a much wider scale and a much depth. And doing so can allow you to solve problems that you couldn't solve before. For example, voice recognition and images. You probably see some New York Times news lately, and I think we are actually making news even within our, 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 our uh, own uh, facilities as well of how we recognize voices, how we can recognize images a lot better. Traditional machine learning algorithm work well with known features. But when you come into uh, domains where the features are not very well known, for example, voice uh, or images, it's very difficult to extract all the right features, and doing so, uh, it, it's all that matters about picking the right features in order to do something intelligent to recognize that. So applying a deep learning technology, which we are online right now, you can see that we can do a picture search of the first lady's, China's first lady's face. You pull out regularly all the photos of hers in the past as well. So, and including the, the product that she wear. So using deep learning, you can recognize images, uh, logos and products, and it be more intelligent as we process uh, all these information on the internet. Speech, we have a, a, a voice recognition, and it's actually a very powerful. I, I play with uh, Siri, of course, I mean in China, Yes, but we have a different way of interacting with the uh, cell phone. And all this time very nicely, again, using a uh, very deep technology within it. And the result has been amazing. But of course, I think there's still a, a, a lot more to do. Uh, the deep learning, I think we've made some good breakthrough in the last two years, one or two years. I think more will come going forward. So this is my last slide, the future of big data, the digital universe. So if you see the, the timeline at the bottom from 2009 to 2020. 2013 with all the petabytes that I mentioned to you, right? Orders of magnitudes of National Library of China. And that's only the beginning. You see the orange dot, dot at the exponential curve. In the going into the future, just now, um, uh, Ambassador Walk was saying something about intelligent homes, right? Smart homes. And I just want to share a simple story here. Uh, I bought a device called Nest. Uh, very recently, okay. do you, anyone know Nest? What is it about? Oh, good. Okay, Nest. And I'm, I'm very, very amazed. I'm, I'm so amazed that because one day I received an email. I received an email from my thermostat telling me something about my air conditioning usage and saying that, wow, I saved you this much money. And in your neighborhood, they are spending more money because they don't have me. But for you, thanks to me, I'm saving you money. So my device start interacting with me to something that I'm very comfortable with, through email, showing me data, intelligent results. Okay. Okay. And this is only the beginning, tip of the iceberg. And I think we talk about controls, but I think control is one thing, but meaning, making things meaningful to me, help my, my life better. I think this is something that big server farms we are hoping to do. Get all this data in from, from mobile devices, homes, wearable devices, and uh, making sense of that, and then prompt me at the right time and saying that, hey, look, you are taken care of, and uh, you have a good quality of life. So going forward, we hope that we have the infrastructure ready and to make all these things, and the algorithm ready to make us intelligent living possible for the masses. Thank you.